I'm going to be talking about a topic that's, that's very near and dear to me. Um, I am about to launch a fund, which will be announced next week with some partners um, uh, here in New York City. Uh, it's a venture fund of $120 million, um, but it will be looking at investments in the U.S., but leveraging a global network of funds. And I think that uh, VCs, uh, just like startups and other businesses, uh, need to be more global uh, in today's age, and uh, I'm excited to uh, embark on that, that venture uh, very soon. But um, first, I'm going to start off with uh, my personal story. Um, back up to uh, the mid-1970s, I had been born in, in Nairobi. My parents, who are of Indian descent, um, were um, uh, raised and born in, in Tanzania. And I, uh, when I was a few years old, my parents uh, saw a lot of turmoil in East Africa post-independence and uh, decided to pack up, leave everything, leave their lives behind, and move us to the, the United States. And I'm not sure why. Oh, the, the middle screen. Can we get that back up? Um, so now, now we, we came to a developed country from an undeveloped or a developing country and uh, started our lives uh, here on the East Coast. In 1982, we went uh, back to India. And my parents um, uh, took us to an ancestral village, my dad's ancestral village. And uh, we visited a hut. There was nothing else there, no running water, no electricity but very warm, uh, distant relatives who fed us and, and regaled us with stories of living there. And we were about to leave, and um, you know, even though they had nothing, uh, they didn't ask us for money, they didn't ask us for water, uh, I mean, or, or uh, uh, food, they asked us for batteries for their uh, radio. And that was a defining moment for me when I realized the importance of connectivity and how people all over the world, no matter how much or how little they have, have this desire for connectivity to other people in the world. And I would never have imagined, you know, back then, 20, 30 years ago, that, um, that the world would be where it is today when we have unprecedented connectivity around the world. And this Maasai, um, you know, when I grew up going back to Africa, I uh, would, you know, we'd drive around the countryside and see these Maasai. I would never have imagined a mobile phone in their hands and, and all the possibilities that, that the mobile phone would, would provide them. I wouldn't have imagined a mobile phone in my hands either back then. So, so this presentation is, is going to take you on a journey around the world. Uh, we'll talk about some macro trends, and then I'll hone in on a few sectors that are experiencing uh, innovation in, in different countries in different ways around the world, and then I'll take some questions. So let, let's just back up. Now, tech innovation, um, when, when we've talked about tech innovation, it's mostly been about Silicon Valley and, and all the great companies that have uh, arisen out of, out of Silicon Valley, uh, the, the Intels, the Facebooks, the, the Googles of the world. But the times are changing, as I've alluded to. And uh, we'll go through macro trends, um, which are feeding into some of the tech trends that are then feeding back into some of the macro trends. And then the three sectors I'm going to review with you are e-money, e-commerce, and, and healthcare. So the world population, um, let's talk about human capital, because that's going to be our greatest resource uh, in the future. And they're going to be the future uh, consumers of the world. Uh, the world's population hit 7 billion in October of last year. This is significant because we all need to figure out a way how best to leverage this vast human capital. Now, if you look at these charts, um, the uh, first graph is a snapshot of the most populated uh, countries in 2010. No surprise, China and India are, are at the top. Um, they have over a billion people each. A distant third is the US, followed by many developing nations, Indonesia, Brazil, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria. And then we have uh, Russia and Japan uh, rounding out the top 10. 
now, in uh, 2050, um, India is going to overtake China in terms of uh, population. U.S. still remains third. And then we see Nigeria popping up a few spaces to, to be number five after Indonesia. And Russia and Japan actually lose uh, population. That's population growth. This, this map uh, is showing the average population growth rates. Um, the dark green countries are uh, experiencing negative population growth. And uh, Russia and much of Eastern Europe is, is in that category. Uh, the red countries are experiencing the most growth, which is 3% plus a year. The dark brown, which is a lot of Africa, is 2% uh, a year. And then uh, the yellow, which is where most of Latin America and India and, and some of the Middle East, uh, it's 1%. It's the light green, which is the US, um, and China, interestingly enough, because they, they've had this one uh, child rule, will be experiencing 0 to 1% growth. Now, you can see from this that uh, the developed world as we know it is stagnant in terms of population growth and, and, and sometimes even contracting while the population of the developing world uh, continues to expand. So then now let's look at the median age globally. Uh, the youngest is, is uh, the, the dark brown. And again, a lot of Africa falls into that category. Red is the next youngest, uh, which is a 20 to 25 year olds. And this is a current snapshot. And then we have India, Brazil, and Mexico uh, in the yellow category. Uh, which is uh, 25 to 30. So this is an, a, a prime age right now that a lot of these uh, countries that are experiencing you know, population growth are, are, are all under, under 30. Uh, Russia, China, and U.S. And, and most of Europe is 35 to 40. Why is this interesting? Um, as people live longer uh, throughout the world due to advances in healthcare, a youthful population will be productive. And an aging population may create a stress on the economy. It may not if, if we make enough strides uh, in terms of health care and innovation to keep those people productive. But these, this is the world we're all going to be living in very, very soon. And then the same regions that have a younger population and more population growth are the same ones that are growing uh, their GDPs at a faster rate. These are the regions that will contain the purchasing power and innovation potential in the future. So we need to know what's happening in these regions and, and continue to encourage positive growth in these regions. So let's talk about the next 50 years, knowing what we just saw, what are some safe assumptions to make. So the developed markets. Um, we all know, uh, based on uh, the news from, from Europe and, and what we're experiencing in this country, that we're saddled with high deficits and debt and aging infrastructure. However, it's not all doom and gloom. I, I think you know, we, we're undoubtedly still home to a great amount of innovation and human capital and resources here. And we can't forget that. I think we're going to continue to be well positioned if we take into account know what's happening in the rest of the world and, and, and collaborate and, and, um, and uh, work together to solve some of our problems as well as, as the developing world problems. And we also have the opportunity to access billions of consumers in these uh, emerging economies and, and corporations that are going to need services. So we can export to these countries and, and that, that are consuming at, at fast rates. Now the developing markets, um, you know, they're turning less risky in a lot of ways. You talk to money managers, and um, you know, a lot of the concerns around the developing markets are starting to go away, uh, if not fully, they're they're being lessened. Uh, while you know, the developed world, because of the high debt, I think governments have. Um, uh, you know, over 100% uh, debt ratios in, in most of the, uh, the developed markets. So you can see that the developing markets uh, have a less risky profile in a lot of ways. The emerging markets will be well over uh, one half of the global GDP on a purchasing power basis very, very soon. 
And so this growing middle class you saw from the population growth, uh, the human capital, the technological advances are all going to continue to power development. Now, there's still challenges in the developing world, as anybody who's traveled to India or, or Africa, uh, Africa know. Uh, infrastructure, agriculture, education, literacy, and health are challenges. But again, technology can play a role in helping uh, alleviate some of these. The interesting about China, you know, it has a large population. There's obviously tons of growth there, but it's going to have an aging population in the future. 25% um, of China's population will be over the age of 65 um, by 2025. And India, which will have a larger population, uh, will have a more youthful population. So I'm always intrigued when people focus on China and not as much on India because um, you know, I see so much innovation and, and potential in the future coming out of India. And India also has some very strong ties back to, to Africa and a lot of cross-collaboration happening already there. So let's start talking about technology, um, the World Wide Web. Now, while the penetration, internet penetration in the developed markets is definitely higher than what exists in, in the developing markets, the U.S right now accounts for only about 10% of the world's internet users. There are uh, 500 million internet users in India and China alone, and 700 million more are going to come online by 2015, generating billions and billions of dollars of, of commerce potential for all of us. So in this new landscape, <clears throat> technology, uh, is, is going to play a role in economic growth. Um, there's a World Bank study that was done a few years ago that's often quoted that talks about the impact of mobile phone and mobile phone penetration um, in, in these developing markets. So for every 10 percentage point increase in mobile phone penetration, there's an extra 0.8% of annual economic growth in these regions. So the mobile phone is, is not just being used for entertainment purposes or a nice to have in these places. They're changing these economies in a positive way. And then what's also interesting, even if you look at some of the more developed markets, there are different usage models that are emerging in different countries. Uh, so in, in Japan and China, uh, we can look to them to see new gaming technologies, virtual goods. They, they're huge consumers of virtual goods. Malaysia it uses uh, digital media and purchases the digital media at a faster rate than, than most other countries in the world. And Indonesia is, is one of the world capitals of, of social networking and usages around social networking. So these are all important uh, to, to keep track of and, and see what could be imported back to the US and other markets. So this is Social Media Week. Let's talk about the social world, and I, I love I love this graphic, this picture, because it shows it's it's, it's women in in India um, in in a village uh, gathering around to learn uh, how to use a computer, and you notice these women are not you know in, in their teens, they're middle aged, and and so this phenom this technology phenomenon that's happening around the world is happening across demographics, across socioeconomic levels uh, because it's unleashing connectivity to people who never had connectivity before and that that's very very powerful this slide shows uh, social network penetration in, in countries around the world and the global average is is 50 percent and this is out of active um, uh, online users so this is not out of total population so how many people are using social networks actively um, who are already online? And so the global average is around 50%, and the US is, is very close to that, that 50%. But look who's ahead of, of the US. And we have the Philippines, number one. They're almost at 80%. So 80% of the people who are online are using social networks actively. Then we have Indonesia, Malaysia, Brazil, Russia, India, Singapore, Poland, Mexico. Very interesting. 
So, and, and most of these countries are also um, uh, primarily connecting through mobile phones. So mobile social networking is being used by, by, by these countries more than some of the more developed uh, nations. And, and they, you know, a lot of these cultures are, are very social cultures to, to begin with. And, and so they are connecting online and never had the opportunity to connect in, in these ways before. So Facebook, we all know the Facebook story. It ranks in the top two websites in every market, except for China, since um, it's not legally allowed in China, although people still do access it. Um, more than 800 million users worldwide, um, and, and 200 million were added in just the last year. So the growth is, is accelerating worldwide, as it even starts to slow in the US, because it, uh, there's so many people in the US on the platform. Three and a half billion uh, pieces of content are shared every week on Facebook. Facebook has had competition in other regions, um, but it, it's been overtaking some of that competition uh, just in the last year. In Brazil and India, there was a platform called Orkut, which, um, which is now number two, um, uh, and, and, and Facebook overtook it. Um, and then they're establishing local offices worldwide to continue uh, the penetration. However, I mean, if you look at this, it's the world Facebook penetration rates as of the end of uh, 2011. Um, North America is at, at uh, 50%, but Africa's at 3%, Asia's at 4%, um, the Middle East is at 8%, the world total is 11%. So there is opportunity for other platforms. Um, you know, uh, while you know Facebook is is going to go public, going to have an arsenal of cash, um, that the social networking on a global scale is no is, is still a wide open uh, field. And you know, for anybody who's starting companies, um, I always say, you know, you can look at the U.S. market, but there's a whole world out there that you can you can develop for and and you can grow large in, in some of these other markets. Twitter, um, we know what a role Twitter played in the Arab Spring, and, and if you look at World Cup, the last World Cup statistics, uh, it broke some Twitter records, which again, I think Whitney Houston's death just broke some more, and you know, we're, we're hearing uh, all these world events that, that are generating uh, you know, millions of tweets a, a second. Um, and there are over 200 million accounts uh, worldwide, um, over 100 million active users, uh, 300 million, 350 million active tweets a day. Interesting, over half of the people who use Twitter access Twitter by cell phone. And then again, if you look at the internet penetration for Twitter um, as of March, I mean, th these, these numbers change pr depending on what's, um, you know, what, if there, there are certain uh, global events. But Netherlands, Japan, Brazil, Indonesia, Venezuela, uh, you can read the rest. Uh, the U.S. is not here in the top ten. So there are other countries uh, who have larger amounts of their population actually being active on, on Twitter. So we just talked about how important uh, the mobile platform is to uh, Twitter. Um, the mobile platform is the largest social network to exist in the world. Um, and it's been changing lives throughout the world, as I've alluded to before. Um, you know, villages that didn't have access before uh, to any sort of connectivity other than a radio or television now have the world literally at their fingertips. So think about this, there's this one story of a great grower in India who began sending uh, his product to uh, Russia for a higher price after subscribing the market data on his mobile phone. A maize grower received an SMS message about bird flu in West Bengal and cut that, that uh, bird flu would have uh, cut his sale price. Uh, so he then decided to store his produce and, and sell it for an increased profit uh, when the market improved a, a few weeks later. So you can see how this small device is contributing to, to growth and, um, and increased profits for the poorest of, of, of the poor. 
this next slide, I'm going to run it, um, and it's going to show uh, the growth of mobile subscriptions per 100 people um, around the world from 1991 to 2010. Um, I think we're on the wrong slide. Okay, so as I run this, amazing statistics. Um, the average mobile penetration for, uh, for per country in the world in 1990, no, 1991 was 0.4%. In 2010, it was 91%. In uh, 1991, Sweden had the highest mobile penetration at 6%. In 2010, Macau had the highest mobile penetration at 206%. So people had multiple cell phones there, and, and that's a phenomenon we're seeing uh, throughout, throughout the world. In fact, uh, 94 countries had mobile penetration over 100% in, in 2010, and Libya was at 171% uh, last year, which if you think about what happened with the revolution there, the mobile phone played an important role in uh, and without that penetration, who knows if, if that would have been possible. This I just like to show for fun because it shows that there is a higher, more people have access to mobile phones than, than uh, utility water services in Africa. And these are, this goes by country, Angola, Botswana, Gabon. It's, an, it's true in, in, every, in, in most countries in, in Africa. That's not a great statistic, but it just shows that if you can reach people through their phone, there's just so much possibility. And Cisco releases uh, a, a report every year talking about mobile uh, data traffic because they have an interest in, in seeing how much data is being passed uh, through uh, wired and, and wireless pipe. They're projecting, and, and they keep accelerating their projections based on what's happening. So that, that rarely happens. We usually have to cut back projections. But in, in, in terms of mobile growth, we've, we've had to accelerate projections worldwide. Um, the projected traffic on mobile phones will increase 18 times from 2011 just to 2016. And uh, this is being caused by more smartphones, more people having access to cheaper smartphones, which is going to start to happen. So most people in, in Africa and India uh, and Latin America still use feature phones, not the iPhones or other smartphones. But uh, companies are working on releasing lower priced uh, smartphones. And, and, and people use a lot more data uh, when, when they are on smartphones. Uh, tablets, um, India just released uh, you know, uh, the $35 tablet uh, for education purposes in India. We're going to continue to see lower cost tablets. And so by 2016, they're, they're est uh, Cisco's estimating um, 108 ex exabytes of, of, of data uh, traveling on mobile platforms. And just to give you a sense of how much that is, that's equivalent to 33 billion uh, DVDs, the amount of data that's on 33 billion DVDs. So let's start to delve into um, uh, some of these uh, specific sectors that are being affected by all of this technology growth. And I'm going to start off with uh, financial uh, services. Uh, we in the US are used to credit cards and debit cards, ATMs, uh, bank accounts. But most of the world is actually unbanked. Um, and the mobile phone is now acting as a bank. For, for many folks around the world. But in each of these examples, I'm going to start off with the US as a baseline. Um, so individual banks have been rolling out mobile apps over the last uh, few years. Uh, so you can check your you know, bank balances. Uh, and, and there's some applications uh, uh, that are allowing peer-to-peer -peer money transfer. So you link your bank account or you link a credit card and uh, you can exchange, if, if your friend is also on the same platform or application, you can uh, send money back and forth. So Venmo is, is one of those. We, we, you know, we've used PayPal here. Um, 
uh, near field communications, which is a contactless um, way to pay. So there'll be a chip in your mobile phone. There'll be a chip on a, you know, a point of sale device, and you, uh, you just tap uh, and, and pay, and that's being used in Japan. That's starting to be rolled out very, very slowly here in the U.S. It's going to be quite a few years before we can get you know, all the retailers to, to uh, build these or implement these terminals uh, where they need to and, and get them into our, our devices. So the U.S. is, is kind of burdened with existing infrastructure uh, when it comes to, to e-money and, and mobile payments, ironically, because we've, we've you know, had, we, we've been at the forefront of, of, of credit cards and, and, and other forms of, of uh, electronic payment. Um, but we are seeing mobile couponing, loyalty cards. Starbucks just uh, rolled out an app um, that links a loyalty card, and you can pay um, pay at the register using that uh, QR codes. But if you see what's happening in some other countries, uh, this seems pretty antiquated. Kenya, um, and I have a little video I'm going to show you. Uh, but M-Pesa was launched uh, in, in 2007 by Safaricom, and it's a way to transact uh, using SMS uh, messaging. Uh, and it started off as just a peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, you, you want to buy something, you send money by text. Uh, now people are actually uh, saving money uh, using different applications built on top of M-Pesa. They're doing bill pay for utilities, um, airtime purchase for their phones. Um, so. Uh, you know, I was just in, in Nairobi last year, and there's a whole incubator uh, called the iHub that's being built for entrepreneurs to build uh, mobile uh, mobile uh, payment platforms, um, and quite, uh, you know, an incubator just like you'd see here in, in the U.S. in terms of the facility and the energy around it. Um, Four billion dollars of M-Money transactions, so with an average value of twenty-four dollars, uh, passed through. Uh, uh, through, through that M-Pesa platform, and that's 13% of Kenya's GDP, large percentage of the GDP. So let's take a look. I think I need the money is on your mobile. I'm having it from here to Moranga to take money to my parents. I can just send it from here. And within seconds, the cash is in their phone. They are going to withdraw it and enjoy themselves. When I'm away and the workers need to purchase maybe a material or something like that, I don't have to go where they are. I just send money to them in their phone. Then they will draw it wherever they are and work is done. So I find it very efficient. Patrick showed us how he loads up electronic value on his phone. So I give her my mobile phone number. Now I'm receiving a message from M-Pesa. Confirm Kenya shillings 100 cash. I have to sign that I've received that money in my phone. Now I can send this money where I want or pay a bill, electricity, water, or buy some items to eat. M-Pesa uses say they value the service because it's convenient, cheap, and safe. Initially I thought these are con men, <laughs> but when it worked, I found it good. Since then, I've been using it. Green and Pesa shops are popping up everywhere, including here in Kibera, a slum of more than a million people in my hometown of Nairobi. There are so many Pesa around here where I can withdraw the cash. It simply makes work easier for me. Anytime you like to use it, everywhere you go, you found it Pesa. A city within a city, Kibera has a fully operating economy. Poor people buy and sell small goods in busy toy markets. Millions of tiny cash transactions like this take place every day. I use M-Pesa. I use it when I'm buying maize from the garden. Before M-Pesa, small merchants like Mary sent money using former bus and matatu companies. But these companies aren't licensed to transfer money, so it's risky. The cost and inconvenience of traveling to the city center meant that Mary was effectively excluded from banking services. But today, mobile money is bringing banking to Kibera, and M-Pesa is a gateway to financial inclusion. Innovations in mobile money are changing the face of banking in Kenya. 
The dream of financial inclusion is seeing the light of day, and my country is leading the way. Okay, I think it's much more powerful when you see it and see it in, in the poorest parts of of, uh, of Africa, such as Tibera. So let's go to Japan now, which is very different environment, uh, but innovating in uh, in different ways. Um, uh, it has the most widespread use of e-money amongst the developed countries, and that's because of the NFC that I mentioned before that the U.S. is, is transitioning to. Uh, the government played a significant role because it owns uh, a, a large portion of, of the, the local uh, or the dominant telco, uh, as well as uh, some of the, the payment terminals, so it was easier to roll out. And uh, so 78% of, of their mobile handsets are NFC enabled. And they have been using these contactless payments for several years now, um, proven they're 40% faster than credit or debit cards and 55% faster than cash since you can just quickly tap and go. And, and another reason it's taken off in Japan is because of the public transport system. And, and that's where uh, people started using it, just to make it easy when you're going to work. You don't want to have to pull out a card or even swipe. It's, it's just a, a more efficient way to, to get through and pay. And uh, interestingly enough, they, you know, they have a large amount. They have $3 billion of uh, e-money transactions, but $9 is the average transaction. That in the, in the following in Kenya, it was $24. Here in Japan, it's being used more for uh, microtransactions. Okay, let's um, talk about commerce next. Um, the, the con we talked about the purchasing power that, that's coming online uh, and, and the growth in the emerging markets. Um, in, in a lot of these emerging markets, far from being a nice-to-have capability, uh, mobile services are now the best way for retailers in emerging countries to, to reach their customers. So how are they doing it? Well, let's look at this. Um, this question was asked, have you ever used your mobile phone this way when you were shopping? So the categories, always take mobile phone shopping, call to discuss purchase, compare prices, and use mobile coupon. If you look at a breakdown by country, it's these um, emerging economies like Brazil and China and India that had a higher percentage of people using their mobile phone in these ways when they're out there uh, at, in, in, in the retail environment. Um, I think the U.S. is catching up, um, uh, as is Western Europe, but it, you, know, you can see how important it is to, to use mobile platforms when you want to sell to these customers or impact these uh, customers' uh, decision-making. The United States was, look, we're, we were at the forefront of the wired e-commerce revolution. Amazon was founded in 1994 uh, and, and sees you know, billions of dollars of, of transactions. Um, and we have 170 million online shoppers that spend $1,000 um, annually. Those are large numbers. Uh, so we, we, we've spawned um, lots of competitors, Amazon, Amazon clones, I shouldn't say competitors, but clones around the world. Um, and, and so people have looked to the U.S. Uh, to, to, as they built out e-commerce uh, in their own countries. Now, in the U.S., this is an exciting time for uh, e-commerce. We're moving towards discovery and, and social commerce. So, so, I mean, we've all heard about Pinterest and, and its phenomenal growth. It's that concept of curation of, of people having so much information at their fingertips that they want uh, third parties and other people, you know, this is social commerce to, to help them uh, uh, sort through all the options they have available. Uh, Fab is, is another highly curated site that's been doing well. Um, and, and this last uh, Christmas season, we, we had a tremendous growth in, in the e-commerce sector. So this is, ex this is a huge area of promise in, in the U.S. and for any entrepreneurs looking uh, to establish a business um, targeting the U.S. consumer. And the M-commerce market is just in very, very nascent stages in, in the U.S. So uh, again, when I talk about couponing and, and, and you look at Foursquare and, and the commerce possibilities around that. So there's, there's lots of growth to be had here in the U.S. and in this sector. Now in China, um, it, we, we're seeing 
phenomenal growth, as we're seeing in, in most, most sectors in, in China, um, but around e-commerce. Um, the spending uh, is expected to increase to $300 uh, plus billion dollars by, by 2015 online. Um, and by that time, they're expected to spend just almost as much as uh, U.S. consumers spend online. Uh, 48,000 uh, items are sold um, every minute on, on uh, China's uh, largest e-commerce site. Um, and interestingly enough, and, and this goes back to some of the statistics we saw about social networking, uh, Chinese consumers are, are, are more likely to use social recommendations uh, than any other uh, consumer in the world when they're looking at product uh, recommendations. Um, they don't trust third parties. They're, they're more likely to trust their friends and, and those and family close to them. Um, and, uh, and, and again, mobile is, is playing a huge role in, in what's happening, but the landline is, is also in China. And let's look at um, Brazil. Brazil's been a smaller e-commerce market, but there is a huge, huge growing middle class there. I mean, so many people are coming out of poverty every, every year there. And um, we're, we're seeing some interesting innovation in, in the retail in-store experience there. Um, they have stores where uh, they put uh, RFID tags, uh, inventory tags, um, uh, to, to track inventory on items. But then uh, people can use their mobile phone to scan and get product information. They have interactive mirrors in some stores where, I don't know whether I like this idea, but, but you can actually email, uh, you can take pictures and email pictures uh, or, uh, to, to friends or, or SMS text uh, or post photos of, of yourself in an outfit and, and, um, to social networks. Um, and you can also get more in inventory information if you're looking for a different color or item. Um, so uh, you know, it's kind of this next, this futuristic uh, retail experience. Um, and uh, you know, group buying sites are, are starting to take off in, in Brazil. Um, and uh, I mean, an interesting statistic that I found is iMusica, which is the, the primary platform to sell music there. Um, they take two months to sell online uh, what they do uh, to sell one day on, on mobile. So again, it's, it's the importance of the mobile platform if you're looking in countries like this. Okay, let's go to healthcare. Now we know that there are going to be aging populations in, in the West uh, and eventually uh, China. We require better home monitoring systems or we're going to have a stress on, on our healthcare systems. Um, Developing rural disease and rural populations make healthcare delivery fair challenging, um, but technology is helping alleviate some of these uh, challenges. And, and I, I think this is one area where we can really see a great amount of reverse innovation with, with uh, innovation that's happening in, in places like India being able to be transferred back to the U.S. as, as we face our own, uh, as we face our healthcare crisis currently, and will continue to do so in the future. So in the U.S., um, by 2050, 20% um, uh, of the U.S. population will be above the age of 65. But we're starting to see some, uh, some progress here in terms of home monitoring systems, a lot of data mining and geno the genome sequencing that can all you know, help prevent disease or, or, or target people who may be susceptible and intervene uh, before you know, there's expensive, um, you know, expensive uh, treatment that, that will be necessary. And there's this whole emerging area of the quantified self. Um, it's apps and devices that allow self-tracking. And, and I'm seeing so many startups in, in this, uh, this particular uh, sector. Um, and it, I don't know if you've heard of the Fitbit, but it's a little device that can track how many steps you take, how many calories you burn, and then you can compare it to your friends and, and you know, bring a little bit of the gaming mechanics and competitive uh, nature into you know, keeping yourself healthy. Um, so lots of applications in this space that, that are geared towards individuals to, to track their own health care. Um, and then telemedicine and dedicated mobile devices. Uh, there, there's a, a BlackBerry that has uh, has sensors on it where you can actually um, uh, track 
uh, or, or uh, read your e ECG and send it to your doctor. So you don't have to go in uh, to the doctor and you can self-monitor. Um, and then remote emergency care. Uh, there's a whole new generation of doctors now that, are, that grew up using uh, technology. So we're seeing more doctors on iPads and smartphones that facilitate uh, patient communication. Um, and, and then, you know, electronic health records. And so the system is becoming more efficient here due to these technologies and, and an individual initiative around using some of these applications. India is, is very, very interesting in terms of uh, developing low-cost uh, healthcare and, and devices. Um, India, the Indian population has a large diabetes problem, which is going to happen pretty much all over the world as, as we have more aging populations. And so there's a lot of clinical t trials and research being done uh, in Indian data crunching around uh, diabetes and, and solutions to diabetes and, and uh, tracking. Um, GE developed a joint venture uh, with Wipro uh, for the development of low-cost medical devices. And, and some of these are infant warmers um, and uh, an ultra-portable ECG, which is, which is pictured here, which costs just about $500, um, as opposed to the thousands, uh, tens of thousands of dollars of, of some of the uh, devices in the U.S., uh, low-cost pacemakers and x-ray machines. And the rural population there dictates a different healthcare delivery uh, system. And India has six doctors for every 10,000 Indians. Um, China has 20 per 10,000 citizens. The UK, 166 per 10,000 citizens. And the US, um, uh, close to 600. So you can say, I mean, India at six versus the US at 600. So th there's a shortage of doctors there. So they've really had to innovate. Um, and 80% of the doctors in India are in urban areas, while 70% um, of the population lives in rural areas. So there's that mismatch. And, and so, you know, they, they're, using, um, they're, they're using mobile dial-a-doctor services to be able to reach the rural population through portable health clinics and, and telemedicine. So again, like on the telemedicine side, some of these dial-a-doctor services I can see, you know, us using here in the U.S. Um, and then they've also made great advances in, in paperless uh, records. And then we're going to talk about Nigeria and Ghana. And, and there's a company there called M uh, Pedigree, which uh, targets um, counterfeit pharmaceuticals, uh, which is a huge problem and a growing problem uh, globally, but particularly in the uh, developing markets where 25% the drug market is, is counterfeit, resulting in um, 700,000 deaths uh, a year. So they have worked with the pharmaceutical companies to uh, put a code on, uh, on the packaging, and, and that code can be text messaged, messaged when a, uh, a person buys the medication, and then um, there's an instantaneous verification of whether this is a legitimate uh, a drug. And then uh, there's an ability to automatically uh, report it if it's if it's counterfeit. Um, and you know, as as drug development moves outside of the U.S., uh, you know, uh, doctors are very concerned, and pharmaceuticals are very concerned about this as as a problem. So this is being going to be rolled out uh, all through Africa, India, and and again, I think there's potential uh, to to reach the developed world with this too. So uh, this hyper-connected world that we've just walked through and we just kind of touched, uh, you know, just on the surface of what's happening, what innovation is happening around the world. What does that mean? Um, you know, there's so much innovation still to come. We're just in the early, early stages. It's hard as a, v as a VC and where I stand and what I see every day to not be optimistic about this world. And, and, and the great progress we're making through technology. And that's not to say there aren't challenges, but uh, it's an exciting time uh, for, for all of us. And you know, the next Steve Jobs, everybody says, where, where is he or she going to come from? And it could be from anywhere globally, given, um, given that technology development is happening on, on this vast scale and, and problems are being solved at all corners of the world through technology. I think uh, challenges is uh, transferring 
uh, knowledge to different regions. I mean, we, we have a great amount of, of knowledge and expertise here, and, and we need to share that with the rest of the world while we also learn from, from the rest of the world and what's happening there. And building out local innovation ecosystems is, is key. And, and I mentioned Nairobi. They're starting to do it. I was in Indonesia last year. They're incubators and you know, new uh, uh, angel investment groups popping up. But all these entrepreneurs need guidance and, and mentorship. And, and we need to do it on a, on a global scale. Um, and, and accelerate this cross-border innovation. Um, and I'm going to leave you with this clip. Um, and it's, uh, it's about the power of a simple SMS message. Um, last year, over 8 trillion um, text messages were sent around the world. And most of those are you know, for just uh, standard communication, let's meet up later, or you know, very, very quick uh, social purposes. Um, this is how. SMS can, can be used to, to save lives. And it's a particularly special clip to me because it, it's filmed in, in, in the town where my mom was born, a little town on um, the coast of uh, Tanzania. That's it. <laughs>